<clears throat> Hello. So uh, today is the uh, 23rd of uh, January uh, 2022. And on this day, the 23rd of January, uh, I mean, uh, on this day is connected with two architects. The first one, Joseph Plechnik, and the second one, Gottfried Bern. So I will talk about both today. Let's start with, uh, with uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Plechnik. So uh, he was born uh, on this day, the 23rd of January, but in 1872, and um, was a Slovene architect, <clears throat> that is from Slovenia, who had a major impact on the modern architecture of Vienna, Prague, and Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia, most notably by designing the iconic triple bridge and the Slovene National and University Library Building, as well as the embankments along the Ljubljanica River, the Ljubljana Open Market Buildings, the Ljubljana Cemetery, parks, plazas, etc. His ar architectural imprint on Ljubljana has been compared to the impact Antoni Gaudi had on Barcelona. Well, not a little uh, thing, and certainly a very, uh, you know, uh, flattering uh, comparison. I truly think this uh, Slovenian architect uh, deserves a lot of attention because I think he was uh, excellent and uh, an enigmatic figure in a way, but it is amazing how he was able to impress cities like Vienna, Prague, beyond the, you know, the, the capital of, of Slovenia, <clears throat> and he built significantly there. So um, there is much to learn from this gentleman. So his style is associated with the Vienna, Vienna Secession style of architecture, type of Art Nouveau. This is the, the description from Wikipedia. Besides in Ljubljana, he worked in Vienna, Belgrade, and on the Prague, Prague Castle. He influenced <clears throat> the avant-garde Czech cubism. <clears throat> he is also the founding member. <clears throat> he was also a founding member uh, of the Ljubljana School of Architecture, joining it <clears throat> upon an uh, invitation by this person, Ivan Vurnik, another notable Ljubljana architect. Sorry about uh, my voice has some problems, but I hope I'll, I'll, uh, I'll manage it. <clears throat> This was the man, um, a very intense man, and uh, I think uh, very unconventional, and uh, his architecture uh, uh, truly uh, deserves, again, I think, uh, uh, re-evaluation, because he, uh, during postmodernism, he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, studied again and so on, but then came the, you know, uh, deconstruction, and then the beginning of the 21st century, and uh, the, you know, a concern with his architecture diminished a little bit, but I think, I think there are valuable uh, lessons in his work, and we'll talk about them. Here he is with a with a little dog, smoking in his advanced age. Something uh, very rarely rarely we would see today. People don't smoke any longer, but uh, a few, I guess, still do. Anyway, as a proud man. And he had reasons to be proud because uh, he was, uh, as I said, an excellent architect and very special and very whimsical. I love this picture of him, you know, uh, with, uh, with this bird and, uh, you know, he's dressed like a, you know, like a prophet in a way. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you think, but I think we need insp inspirational figures. I think we need mentors. I think we need strong cultural personalities, strong individualities with a unique vision um, uh, in the world and about architecture and so on. And we don't have them. I mean, there are some perhaps, but I'm, I doubt that uh, the so-called uh, uh, star architects of today can, can distance themselves from a damaging uh, mundanity. Uh, this architect, although he was very successful in Vienna and Prague and so on, he was uh, in an, to an extent, I think, a solitary figure, a romantic figure. How many romantic architects do we have today? 
you know, not many, you know, uh, the most successful ones have huge offices, uh, you know, with hundreds of people uh, and uh, this kind of, uh, you know, poetical, romantic uh, vision about an architect is uh, almost absent today. But Frank Lloyd Wright cultivated it. Uh, uh, there were other people in the, in the modern architecture that uh, had this persona. Uh, but uh, something happened, you know, it's our work became, our, our world became a strange from what we call uh, romanticism. Here he is again. And uh, let's look at some sketches and drawings by uh, Joseph Plechnik. Uh, he was uh, an architect immersed in the past, but he also advocated the future. And uh, so there was a modernity. For example, he built the first concrete, um, exposed concrete, I mean, not the whole church, but it has uh, exposed concrete parts. Um, the first modern church with uh, exposed concrete in uh, Vienna, and you are going to see it. Uh, you know, and he was young. I think he was also the, the pupil or he worked with uh, Otto Wagner. But the fact that he became so, uh, you know, uh, uh, sought after architect in Vienna, already a city with great architects and great culture, uh, says a lot about him. Uh, he built, uh, you know, other things in Vienna, and we are going to see them. So now I just show some uh, some drawings uh, by him. <clears throat> I truly believe in the individuality of the architect. I'm, I believe actually in the individ individuality of anyone in any field. We need to defend our individualities against normatizations, regulations, uh, crippling, uh, uh, you know, uniformization and, and so on. No, we have to assert who we are, as uh, Joseph Blechnik, Blechnik did. This building we are going to see, the plan is here, quite narrow towards this corner. It's an interesting building. You see the elevation here. Yes, the, the language is not yet, uh, you know, dramatically modern, but <clears throat> uh, considering when, 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 uh, when he lived, uh, it's important to notice the, the innovations. He's one of the most whimsical architects that I know of. And uh, he is an architect, he was an architect who uh, narrated. There is a narration, a narrative aspect to his architecture and sometimes in literal terms. He did a project for the parliament of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Slovenia that I regret very much it was not built. Uh, it made it into a stamp, onto a stamp in Slovenia. Uh, I hope one day they will build it. It would have been one of the one of the wonders of uh, Slovenia and Europe, and you are going to see the project, but it was not built. Now, we, uh, we begin the trip through his works in 1901 in Vienna. The Villa Langer, I don't know if I pronounced well, uh, here it is, <clears throat> you know, uh, if you look at the texture, I, I just wrote yesterday something against, uh, you know, excessively white and flat buildings, and I'm really tired of them. I am tired of them because life is not white, life is not flat, and our building shouldn't be white and flat either. Okay, we did some white buildings, Villa Savoy included, but let's stop really. Uh, here, here we have an architect who brought you know, uh, the, an interesting uh, um, envelope to the building or skin. You know, this 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 wall has a character, has a creativity, uh, uh, um, and yes, it has ornament. And I think ornament is is supposed to is supposed to be present in the building. You know, it's a it's a block of flats. But compare it. Com we had yesterday a discussion about uh, a block of flats uh, built in Bucharest. We compare this building, which is cubicle, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a block of flats with that building. Look at the entrance into the building. 
is not like in a cage. It's, a, it's an entrance like into a building. Look at the windows. You know, they have character. They, they, they differ. One is like this with a, you know, a, a moderate bow window. Uh, the others are a little bit different. And then the texture and the, um, the ornamentation of the facade also matters. But we don't be like this any longer. And I wonder why. Why? I mean, you see clearly, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, it's a different kind of architecture. It's, it's complex, it's poetical, it's not cynical, it's not inhibited, and it's not inhibited. Of course, we could be like this today as well. We could. I just saw today um, the, the House of Music built by Su Fujimoto, an architect whom I like in Budapest. And I have to tell you, it is inferior. And I, I repeat, I reiterate, um, I like uh, Su Fujimoto. But, but the House of Music he built in Budapest, while it has some qualities, it also has some problems, which makes it, in my opinion, a little bit inferior to the Art Nouveau buildings of Budapest. And uh, I'm talking about one of the best uh, architects today. Villa Loss, Melk. This is not uh, Adolf Loss, 1901. Now you see even here, you know, compare this building with our white boxes. You know, there is something going on here. Look at this balcony here. Look at this window here. Look at this. Look at this corner with the even color being present. And why is it that we impoverished architecture so much? Because I think, <coughs> I think we are at the point of not even loving architecture any longer. Because how much love could you have for a white box? You know, this building is also you know, rather cubical. It's modern, but it's a, it also betrays a sensitivity, which, I mean, look, just here, there is, uh, you know, some complexity. It's something uh, eventful happening, aesthetically speaking. You know, uh, this is what the architect is supposed to do, to bring, uh, you know, <coughs> please be kind and turn off the microphone. I hear, uh, I hear someone coughing, and uh, I don't mind. I cough myself, but... Uh, you know, I, I would appreciate if there is a, a background without too much disturbances because uh, I have difficulties to concentrate. I would really appreciate. Thank you. Now, another villa from 1902, Villa Weidmann. Uh, you have to understand these are buildings 120 years old. Uh, and, uh, but even here, you know, I, okay, let's not go so far as playing me a little, you know, divine beings at the top. This is inconceivable for us today. Although sculpture was, uh, was uh, to be present and thought of by Konstantin Melnikov in a very modern otherwise project for Paris. Uh, you will see a, a formidable, um, office building built by Joseph Plechnik in the center of Vienna, almost across the street from the great St. Stephen Cathedral. This man had the courage to hang, a, you know, an archangel on the facade of an office building, but not without reason. I mean, with, there is a narrative there that explains it, but uh, again, it's not just about the narrative, it's also about the visual impact of a large scale archangel, you know, hanging on the facade of an office building, a modernistic office building. Uh, uh, maybe we should do that again. And I, I think the, the potential for a, a narrative architecture is high. That is, if you were for any client, anyone who commissions your building has a life, has a history, has specificities in his or her life, you know, one is a psychiatrist, one is a dentist, one is a lawyer, one is an accountant, one has a certain past, another one has another kind of past, one has certain hobbies, another one has other hobbies. Well, there is a narrative in one's life. Why can't we express something of that narrative into the building? As Joseph Plechnik did in that office building that you are going to see soon. 
uh, this is another, you know, uh, look at this, 1902. It's, it's an apartment house, a mid house Langer in Vienna. Uh, I, I'm almost tempted to say that uh, these apartment buildings built by Joseph Plesnik are more interesting than those built by Otto Wagner. Uh, there, there is a, uh, you know, uh, there are so-called accidents, you know, like the presence of these uh, two balconies here. You would say, why is it that they are here, not here, not here or here? Well, you know, I understand from, from a rational point of view and the democrat, democratic point of view, okay, we should uh, create balconies for everyone, but, but you know, small differences exist between people, between buildings, between countries, between cities, and so on. So why not have even so-called capriciously just two balconies where you feel like making two balconies? There are other differences because here there, there might not be balconies, but you see the elevation uh, has uh, an ornamental, uh, you know, addition, so to speak, which makes in a way compensates for the absence of a, of a balcony here as well. And who knows, maybe also the function, the, you know, inside the building uh, differs from one, one floor to the other. Not the, only that, look at the, you know, again, this is architecture. Let's not simplify everything into flat whiteness, really, no. No, it, it's, it's, we are saying no to life. Okay, we did it for a while, at the beginning of the 20th century, but why should we continue 100 years later in the same way, as if, as if there was nothing else in architects? Look, there was. Uh, almost about the same time when Adolf Loos was uh, proclaiming uh, the death of uh, ornament, there were other architects who thought otherwise, including another side of Adolf Loos because he, he used uh, very ornamental marble in some of his projects. And so this did Miss van der Hohe. Now, this is, uh, this is the building that I, I, I anticipated, that I talked about, that office building with, uh, uh, with the archangel on the, on the facade of the building. Built in 1905 in Vienna, and it's really meters away from St. Stephen's Cathedral. It's in the center of the center of the center of Vienna. Here it is. You see the archangel here, and you see the silhouette, the size of a human being. This is big. Now, what architect today would hang on the facade of an office building, and, and, and the building is impressive by itself, with or without the archangel? But what architect today would do something like this? I know of none. Really, we are so out of imagination, so full of ourselves that we, we don't even think of expressing something because this is with a reason place here and I'm going to, to, to read uh, about it uh, to you in, in a minute. Why is it that we are so stiff in the architecture that we do today? Uh, we play with space, we do sometimes extravagant forms, but there is no narrative. Look at the top here, you know, eh, eh, okay, you will say this is old fashioned. Well, it might be old fashioned, but I have to tell you, there are tourists who take pictures of it. There are architects who look up and uh, maybe feel inspired. The top of the building matters because it's the transition of the building. I mean, Louis Sullivan did the same thing. At the cornice, at the very top of the building, he changed things because it was in the proximity of the sky. It was the culmination of the building. Even human beings have hair. You know, the top part of a human body, of a human being, it has uh, its specificities. It's not just, uh, you know, a, a terrace or a flat, a flat ending. There is more to it. And uh, this was something very known in the past, but uh, now, uh, in the name of functionalism and minimalism, uh, we simplify excessively. So this is, um, this is the name of, of the client. Uh, I hesitate to pronounce it, but you see it written. Uh, written. Uh, and this is the architect, Joseph Plechnik. I just 
checked on his on the pronunciation of his name, and it's something like this: Joseph Joseph Plechnik. Uh, and um, look at it. I would like to know if there is an architect, you know, uh, within certain limits of normality, saying this is not an interesting and convincing building. I think it is. You know, and uh, the, 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 the accidental uh, archangel here uh, is uh, adding to the, you know, to the, uh, you know, the uniqueness of the building. But even if you make abstraction of that, as I said, this is a very fine building. In a city which knows about architecture and knew about architecture and had a lot of good, excellent architecture because excellent architects lived and built in Vienna. Um, so I hope I have here the text. Yes, I'm glad because it's an interesting story. So it's an office building. Uh, visually, you know, or architecturally, you can contemplate certain things here having to do with architecture. You see the windows have uh, their own um, character and they are not, they are different, these windows from these windows and also different from the, you know, storefront windows at the bottom. Also different from the, from the windows at the top. The top might be envious of the floors below, but the top has the pride of having a more ornamented and thus richer treatment, architecturally speaking. Now let's uh, let's read about what made this architect bring the archangel on top. Uh, I mean, on the facade of his building. Um, okay, so. But why would a wealthy industrialist in early 20th century Vienna install a monumental image of St. Michael on the facade of his house anyway? Well, St. Michael, Archangel Ma Michael. The answer is quite simple. According to the biblical tradition, it's the Archangel Michael who overcomes Satan and all evil spirits. He was there, I think we need more of, uh, of this archangel in our lives as well. Uh, he was therefore chosen by Zachel as a slightly far-fetched and somewhat blasphemous symbol of the product which had made this family, the Zachel family rich. Uh, they, they invented and sold this insecticide which guaranteed to overcome all evil bugs and midges. So the client of the building was, uh, you know, the owner of a, of a company that produced this insecticide, which guaranteed the overcome all evil bugs and midges. And uh, I know something about these evil bugs too, because uh, it's hard to get rid of them, but especially if you are not a great, uh, you know, uh, houseman. Uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, so the architect, you know, um, I don't know if the idea belonged to the client or to the architect, but I imagine to the to the architect because he was whimsical in other projects. Uh, this is this is the I think he had the idea to to hang the, the fighter against all evil on the facade of the building. This is the you know an advertising for that insecticide that this man was producing. Uh, from that time, of course, 115 years ago, or 20 years ago, and again, back to the building. So I like this, you know, there is a story attached to the building and uh, it's, uh, it's the building uh, has uh, an addition, architecturally speaking, which in my opinion is, uh, uh, it's not just whimsical, it's also aesthetically intriguing and even pleasant. But even what's happening at the top is not to be ignored. Would any of us do something like this at the top of our buildings? Of course not. Would anyone today, you know, uh, make this kind of windows? Of course not. No, no, we are so afraid. We only use straight lines, you know, we don't complicate matters because we have to build quickly another white cubicle box and another one and another one and another one. Anyway, hello, Archangel Michael. Please uh, multiply yourself and come to our city and our country and our world and our Europe and especially at the frontier 
between Ukraine and uh, Russia. This is the plan of the building. The building, you know, I mean, the, the plan is, uh, as you can see, is rather rational, you know, structurally sound, uh, it's clear, it's a, it's a clean plan, but, uh, and, and quite adequately for an office building. Now, we arrive at the Church of the Holy Spirit in Vienna, and this is the building I told you about, and I visited several times with architecture students from uh, Romania. It is the first building, the first modern building that uses exposed concrete uh, in its, uh, you know, uh, in its being, and especially, you, this is very apparent at the front elevation. It's a good building, and the, and the crypt underground is perhaps the most interesting uh, uh, thing, but um, also some details. I hope I have here, I used to make many pictures. You see, the interior is, uh, you know, uh, rather simple if you make abstraction of the artwork and, uh, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, the lighting. Uh, it's almost a cubistic building, like the facade of the building is austere. And yes, you see, you'll see the, the, the exposed concrete is, is a special concrete, you know, it has a, um, a rawness, it's, it's rough, but it, it's also, I would say, uh, warmer than uh, the, the concrete, uh, signature concrete of Tadao Ando. I hope I have, um, if I don't, I apologize, but uh, I should have had pictures of a, you know, a fragment of this concrete um, uh, that the church employs. This is the crypt that I was telling you about. I had difficulties when I went there to turn the light on. Uh, you can enter, of course, uh, freely in, in the church. There is no, uh, uh, you know, uh, opposition, so to speak, or there is no one there. It's a, it's, it's, it's a building that belongs to the city and there is no one there. The crypt, I like it more. I mean, I like more the, the image, the old image, you know, with, uh, without benches, the space and uh, just, with, you know, it is in black and white, but it says something about, you know, the, this interesting uh, crypt where the columns are uh, peculiar, you know, they are geometrical, but they have character because Joseph Plechnik understood something that we do not understand. We only make a column, you know, straight from the floor to the, where it meets the beam or whatever, the slab, the same way, no base and no capital. But I think both the base where the column touches the slab and where the column touches the beam or the slab, these are, these are, these are specific, uh, moments in the in, in the life of the column which require negotiation between the verticality of the column and the horizontality of the beam or the horizontality of the slab. There is not an accident that from the, the oldest times humankind understood that a column has a base and has a capital done in several ways, Ionic, Doric, Corinthian, and uh, in, other, in other ways, why is it that we do not think in these matters? Why is it that we think that a straight column equal to itself from bottom to top, it's all that's needed? It's not true. It's, it's about, as uh, uh, Kenneth Frampton would say, it's about the adoration of the joint, because this is a, a joining part where the column meets the beam. So unless you adore the joint, you don't even think about such extremely important things. And that's why this man so-called complicated himself in the basement of this church. This is the basement of this church. There are no, uh, you know, uh, windows. So, you know, there is no communication with the exterior. It's, it's completely dark when the, when the, when there is no uh, active uh, artificial light. So again, we can learn a lot from such architects. First, I mentioned uh, narration. 
Second, now uh, an example here about uh, uh, a different conception about what a column needs or should be. I regret I should have had more pictures. Maybe next year, if I pay my homage to Joseph Lechnik, I will uh, add more pictures. Now, the Congress Square in Ljubljana from 1928, uh, it's a square. By the way, I'm going to see also some interesting buildings uh, built by him. So he worked both, you know, uh, as an urbanist, if we are to call uh, this activity so, and uh, as an architect, and even as a landscape architect. Because in my opinion, a good architect can do uh, object design or product design, can do landscape design, can do urban design, can do rural design, something we still don't talk about. Uh, today uh, on Arch Daily, there is again a talk about the future of urbanism. But what about the future of ruralism? You know, even after the exhibition of Rem Kolhas at the Guggenheim Museum dedicated to rurality and to the village that took place a few years ago, even after that, we continue to talk about the city and the city and the city and uh, urbanism. And it doesn't even cross our mind that, as uh, Rem Kolha said, half of the land of the world is actually rural. And the reality of villages and rurality, no, no one can contest. How come we don't even think about the rural or rurality? Now, a fountain at this castle from 1930, uh, look at it, it's whimsical too, you know, to have these heads of lions you know, emerging uh, from, uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, a little bit strange columns and, uh, you know, uh, uh, spitting water, so to speak. You know, it, it has character, it is whimsical, it makes you smile, it's not a, it's not uh, something you can be indifferent to. It, it does make you smile, I think. Uh, and the triple bridge extension, this is a famous work by him, and you'll understand why from 1931, it's in Ljubljana again. Now, again, the, the, the functionalist would say, you know, oh, why didn't he do just this bridge here? Why did he need these two, you know, so close to each other? Well, I hope I have here a view from the top or the site plan, then you'll understand why. But it's a very interesting uh, urban um, creation or context that he created with this triple bridge or, yeah, tri or triple bridges. Um, so this was again, Jose Plechnik in uh, Ljubljana, the capital of uh, Slovenia, which has a very good uh, architecture school, which is on the list with the best 100 architecture schools in Europe. And I'm sure he had a, an effect on that, you know. This is, this is the, the, the catalytic, uh, the, the, the um, uh, you know, power of a, an inspirational personality. It, 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 uh, it inspires things to happen even after, uh, after death. You know, uh, because to have such an inspirational figure, you know, uh, present in the memory of the city and the memory of the architecture school, it obliges you to be equally creative and so on. So you can imagine if this architect is compared with Antoni Gaudi in Barcelona, meaning uh, at the level of his contribution to Ljubljana, uh, this is not a little thing. Look again at the three, uh, and you see here actually that this, this uh, street here is curving. So actually you have these two uh, left and right uh, narrower bridges perpendicular on the street in, in their respective places. This one is perpendicular here, and this one is perpendicular here, while this one is uh, you know, leading right into the center of, uh, of this square. So it makes some sense, but, we, but because of this interesting, uh, you know, uh, disjunction or, or uh, you know, uh, this narrow uh, space in between the three bridges, uh, the, you know, the whole context is, is, is rather interesting. As you can see, people use them. And, uh, you know, uh, here you have particularly vehicular 
uh, traffic, uh, while uh, on the sides you have, uh, you know, uh, just uh, humans walking. Here it is, and you can see better here why he did it in this way. It's probably the only place in, in, in the world where there are three bridges uh, configured uh, in this way. Yes, there is form, of course, but you cannot separate architecture from form. You just can't. You cannot justify everything only in terms of function, function and again function. What about the function of beauty? What about the function of ornament? What about the function of form? Here you see clearly in the, in the well, I was wrong. This is not quite perpendicular on this part of, but uh, you understand it's, it's, it's well designed. This, um, yes, it is. Of course, it is a more expensive uh, bridge than if he did just one. But I think it became a, a locus for the city. It, it is a, a catalyst for the urban life in Ljubljana. A bridge is a um, you know, work of engineering, but not only engineering. You know, that's why an architect is needed. An architect could bring uh, to the engineer's work uh, additional elements which contribute to you know, the, the, the impact that a, a good bridge could have on, a, on a, wherever it is built. We need, I think, anyway, there is much to say. Church of St. Anthony of Padua in Belgrade. This is a church built in Belgrade in 1932 for this saint. I don't you know, St. Anthony of Padua. Uh, here are uh, the, the plans and then two elevations. You see, it's an architecture much more modern for this function, a church, than the countless churches built in Romania in the 21st century or the end of the 20th century. And this was built 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, in Belgrade. I keep saying it, an architect in order to deserve the name Architect has to be creative. An architect in order to be creative must assume a certain level of adventurousness because that's what happens when you are creative, when you generate life, you give life, you create a life, the life of a new building. You cannot just do it, you know, as other people did it, you, if you are creative. So, you know, sometimes you might be wrong in your decisions, other times you might get it right, but it's important to be ad adventurous, to risk, to take risks, to manifest your emotions, your spirit, your, your thoughts. Otherwise, we would have all the buildings the same way. White and flat and cubical. Like this here. But this is, we are not talking about this building, we are talking about this building. We are not talking about the architect, if there was an architect who built this building, we are talking about the architect who built this one. Why? Because this one proved himself creatively, that's why. Okay, maybe it's not the greatest church on earth, but, uh, you know, uh, he tried something. And I don't think it's something, uh, you know, uh, to be you know, rejected. Uh, no. Now, another church. This one is quite interesting in Prague. Church of the Most Sacred Heart of Our Lord from 1932. 
uh, postmodernists at the, at the end of the 90, uh, 20th century were interested in, in this kind of work, but I, I, I think it's a difference. Postmodernism uh, made fun of history, uh, while um, I think uh, an architect like, uh, like uh, Plechnik uh, didn't. He was whimsical, whimsical, it's true, but I think he was also a, a serious, almost a mystic, I would say. In fact, I read about it, that he, he had a mystical, uh, so to speak, uh, mystical preoccupations. So, uh, he was a, an interesting architect. And an interesting architect is an architect who, who feels and thinks in his own way or her own way. And, uh, you know, as uh, sometimes peculiarities. Look at this beautiful corner here, you know. I mean, this is modernism, this is modernity, but it's also, you know, it, 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 shows, it shows again a concern with, uh, with uh, what I mentioned before, the adoration of the joint, because here you have several meetings, like um, Salinger, the North American writer said, um, also, you know, uh, whimsically in one of his uh, uh, short stories, uh, uh, he, he asked the question, what does, a, what does a, a wall tell another wall? And he said, I meet you at the corner. So this is what, this is why the corner is a special, is a special part of a building, because this wall here, and with this wall here, they meet at the corner. Now here at the corner, we have more than just a corner. We also have a column. And, you know, we also have the cornice. So it's all of a sudden, you know, we have various meetings, the meeting between the column and the horizontality of, uh, you know, if it is a terrace or when the roof begins, the horizontal lines at the edge of the roofing, then we have the meeting between this wall and the other wall. We have several meetings. So it's a place of conjunctions. And I mean, this is a, a provocation for the architect who understands that these things do matter. And it's just a detail, so to speak, a detail. But look at the elevation of the building. It's, it's modern, but it's not, uh, you know, uh, otherworldly modern, it's not, it belongs to a culture and to a place and to a history even, uh, and yet it is uh, unique. In Prague, Joseph Lechny, it still stands out in a good sense. Why did Plechnik use this, uh, you know, uh, complication, so to speak, with these bricks emerging? Uh, because again, ornament matters, and because he was would not have been happy, and he was not happy with just a flat white surface. You know, why is it that we don't understand this? You know, it, it, I maybe mean, this is a building which has tectonics as a texture, as a a weaving of materials, you know, it's it's rich, just just this part of this building. And then, you know, yes, uh, there are ornaments on the on the on the floor. There are although the building is also modern. You see the interior. I am sure for uh, members of the Orthodox Church, uh, this would be shockingly modern. It's not shockingly modern. It is modern, but it's not only modern. It's a creation of its time, 1930s or so, in a city which again knows about, about uh, the culture in general and architecture in particular, and that is Prague. We need cultivated theologians. I'm afraid those who, uh, who cover the country here with um, meaningless uh, churches, uh, I'm talking uh, architecturally speaking, uh, are not cultured enough. They don't know. They didn't see 
they didn't they did they don't even imagine that the church can be, be creative but i keep saying if god was and is creative and if man is made in the image and resemblance of god then man should be meaning the human being should be creative too why is it so difficult to understand this this is not alarmingly i mean it's not it's a building of the 20th century clearly it almost has i mean it's 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 a church but uh, its modernity almost points in the direction of uh, but no i shouldn't say so but it, it's 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 sec it's it's a sacred building but it's not crushingly sacred you could even see some elements perhaps of uh, of, um, of, of the secular secular uh, sensibility or secular uh, culture now a house in ljubljana uh, we saw the plan you remember when i show some drawings uh, by um, by pletnik you know uh, this is i mean i don't see this building here but i can imagine it has, it has no architecture but this one does the buildings here you know are they uh, as they are this building i think um, would have been uh, would have been uh, noticeable even in a city like uh, vicenza for example in the proximity of many buildings by palladio i think it's a fine building and you can only imagine what could be done in this space above the studio of a uh, you know recluse but famous uh, artist or uh, who knows something but it's a good building it's a good building on a difficult site because it's very narrow you know i don't know three meters or you know maybe not more than four meters yet i think he built something uh, and uh, here it is joseph lechnik I don't know why this thing had to be here, this pole, but <laughs> I'm sure it was not planted by Joseph Lechny. Uh, anyway. The interior, as you can see, is uh, is modern. If you if you built a staircase like this today, it would be appreciated, I would say, even by Arch Daily. Anyway. Now his own house in Ljubljana, where he also he lived and worked, maybe alone. I don't know. It's a it's a nice little house, whimsical itself, and you are going to see images with his drafting board because there were no computers at the time, and uh, you know the house of an architect. It is said that the shoemaker cannot make shoes for himself. Well, some architects can build for themselves, and uh, we'll take a look at this rather modest building. It's nothing extravagant. Um, it's 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 uh, okay. It has a, a plot of land, as I can see, but the, the building itself, it's it's rather modern, uh, rather modest. Uh, he doesn't stay away from history. He does use uh, maybe that's why the postmoderns. Uh, loved him uh, or rediscovered him uh, but uh, I, I i don't think he used he uses these columns in a you know a superficial way it's a gesture of affection towards the past
here it is the you know the working room the studio of the architect looks familiar now and uh, it's hard not to be nostalgic even melancholy it's the you know the the table the drafting board of the creator of the architect and you see the all the all the tools that he employed Joseph Plechnik, an architect, in my opinion, uh, we should talk more about, uh, not just because he is, he was, you know, kind of a neighbor of uh, Romania. What do we see here? We see a culture, a man of culture, a sensitive man, you know, and this is, this is what I think we should uh, attempt to bring back to architecture, you know, a sensitivity which shows, you know, a uh, good knowledge of history, uh, cultural and spiritual interests, not a bureaucrat, not a businessman, but an architect as, as should be, I think. Yes, it's hard not to be nostalgic when you look at these spaces, at these rooms, and uh, these drafting, bo uh, drafting boards and so on. But you have to understand, this is, was, a, um, was a man born in the 19th century and living, uh, you know, uh, until mid, uh, almost mid uh, 20th century. Here he is, and I even like the way he looks. Again. Do we have romantic architects in today's world? Very few, because the kind of individualism that he promoted and uh, acted in the name of is uh, almost absent today. You know, uh, he was a visionary, you know, and a poet. Even in the way he dressed, I think you see, you can, and you see, you are born in a small country, but. If you have a generous vision and you fight for that vision, being both modest and audacious, later on, some people might remember you and talk about you. Now the Church of St. Michael, another interesting building by Joseph Lechnik, and uh, it would it would take you perhaps a little bit by surprise and it will certainly take by surprise the you know the uh, liturgical man the churchman who dogmatically thinks that the church can be done in only one way and is simply not true um it's rustic it's rural it's primitive in a way but it's a primitive church built by a very cultured man and you know, look at the look at the walls. You know, built with stone, uh, with the, the you know uh, maybe even bricks with um, wood. There is a, a tactile uh, variety uh, uh, here that uh, I think is pleasing, and it's, it's literally an expression of the variety of the world that God created. And the, in the interior, also we have you know, some kind of almost dis disjunctive elements. Like you look at these columns and then you look at these columns, the wooden ones. And there are maybe references also to folklore. And I find it interesting, you know, it's, it's warm, it's whimsical, it's modest, but it's also, uh, you know, has uh, elements of, uh, you know, uh, adventure here, of courage. It's a creative building because it's supposed to be, and the exterior is also, and you, we saw a few churches by him. We saw the one in Belgrade, we saw in, the one in Prague, 
we saw the one in uh, exposed concrete in Vienna. Now we see this one. And, uh, you know, it's rich, it's almost joyous, and it's humane, it's warm, and it's not dogmatic. Although I think it does have a connection with a, a previous, you know, achievements uh, in, 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 in churches in, 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 the, in, the, in the part of the world where it was built. But who would place a tower and, you know, you enter at the, I mean, you enter into the church at the top level and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, this uh, climbing, in a way, it's climbing towards God, you know, and these are the guardians of your, um, you know, uh, pilgrimage or, you know, uh, your ascension, ascending towards God by walking up on this rather long uh, stair. It's, it's an unusual, it had a chance, of course, to be not part of a city, it's outside of, a, who knows, a village, but it's, uh, it's interesting. And I like the windows because the windows, these are windows just like he had in his own house. They are rather domestic and thus secular. So, you know, uh, there is a level of domesticity uh, or secularism brought into the into the building which serves a so-called sacred function. It's a church. Joseph Lechnik. And you know, you see the ivy climbing on this wall right above the entrance into the church. The building doesn't say no to the ivy. The building says yes to the ivy. Now, how many churches in the world do this? We are so afraid of nature. The church in its dogmatic uh, understanding uh, and of the world is so afraid of nature ivy or whatever. No, this building, because it employs natural materials and it doesn't hide them, welcomes the ivy and the ivy feels at home on the wall of the church. Is this the house of God as the church is supposed to be? Perhaps when you walk up this stair towards the entrance into the building, maybe you do have the feeling that you are, you know, uh, walking upwards towards a higher, you know, entity or presence, uh, still at the level of, uh, you know, suggestion, but uh, these suggestions are important. Now, a tomb for Antonin Zvechla, I don't know who this was, uh, from 1933. You know, it's just a column. Uh, it's, it's, you know, very abstract with a cross inscribed and maybe the, the, the you know, the, the name of the inhabitant, so to speak. Now, the Church of Mary of Lourdes in Zagreb, in Zagreb, 1934. Did he design this lamp here? Maybe, but if he did, in itself is a brilliant, uh, brilliant thing. I had seen, and I regret I don't have, I didn't show here details of the church built in Vienna. You know, the handle of a door or things like this, but, but, but done originally and interestingly and creatively, they do matter. Now, Look at the columns here. Who would place the columns like this inside the, the interior of a church? Aren't they interesting? It's almost like the fragment of a constellation of stars on the, on the sky. You know, I, I find it very interesting. And again, it shows the non-conformism of this architect. 
most architects would have shown just the grid that it didn't even cross their minds to place the, the columns of the interior in this way. No, but he does it. And I, I find it uh, liberating and inspiring. You know, we keep, we, we keep thinking or talking about breaking the box, while most of the time we don't break the box at all. This man broke the box. I mean, even if the, the exterior, the perimeter of the building is rectangular, and, you know, in itself a box, but he has his manifestations of freedom, like this one with his, uh, uh, you know, capriciously, I would say musically placed, um, you know, uh, columns, uh, structural columns within the building. Now a pavilion, what is this? Uh, this is uh, another whimsical work by him. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it has elements of folkishness, of, of folk, the folk culture, the rurality, but uh, I, I like it, you know, it's, 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 it's original, it's picturesque, and uh, it seems other people like it too. A pavilion, a small building. And this is another one, also built by him, you know. Joseph Lechnik. It must be beautiful to be a dreamer and to act in the name of the dreams and to have the chance sometimes to build some of them, you know, then you didn't leave for, for nothing, you know. But, but so many of us, unfortunately, spend our lives uh, living uh, somehow as if not our own lives, but somebody else's life. You know, it's exactly because of the depersonalization that we are so good at. You know, we depersonalize ourselves continuously, rejecting and negating our true selves, which we postpone to express or uh, refuse to express in the name of fear, perhaps. Now you are going to see another very interesting building and good building, the, the, the National and University Library of Slovenia, 1949, a large building. This one here. Well, you know, you look at the buildings, surrounding buildings with the sloping roofs, ready sloping roofs. And then you look at this building, the library. And what do we see? We see some connections with the roofs here in terms of, you know, texture and color. It's a library, of course, a university library, a national library, but uh, I think it's good. And he designed everything, you know, uh, everything, not just the building, but also the fixtures, everything. Look at, the, look at the texture of the facade of the wall and compare it with uh, our uh, flat, boring, white walls. Well, okay, it might, be, it might not be your taste, but it doesn't leave you indifferent. It has, a, again, a tactility. It's, it has a, it invites you, it invites you almost to touch it. It's, it has a, it has character, it has a, you know, the, the skin is not uh, cold and dead, it's, it's, it's alive. Is this building old? Yes. Is, it, is this building new? Yes. It's both new and old. Is this the pillar of knowledge? Perhaps.
Why do people stare within the building? Why are they staying in line to enter? Why do they visit it? Because it's a building which is you know, unique and interesting. That's why, otherwise they wouldn't visit it. They wouldn't stare at the ceiling here, even people who are maybe not architects, or maybe they are. I don't know but what I'm saying. If you don't make a building which makes a statement, not in an expensive way or extravagant way, but to, to have its own personality, then you don't expect people to look at, at it. Now, this business stands out. Okay, you might like it or you might not like it. But it's almost like a building between this building and this building, at least chromatically. You know, uh, it has it has both. It has grayness. It has maybe a little bit of uh, you know light gray, like almost towards whiteness. And then the color of the brick uh, connects with what is here, and has stone and the and look at the elevation of the building. symbol is important for architecture so the column of knowledge uh, as i choose to to call it has its importance You know, I, I mentioned handles, door handles. Look at here. You know, when you touch this handle and use it, you are charged with a certain energy that is the energy of creativity. Are we thinking of handles these days? Not really, unless we are Stephen Hall. Stephen Hall used to and made some beautiful uh, creations in this field. This man clearly belonged to history, but he also belonged to modernity. He was not just looking backwards, he was also looking forward. Now, a gate in Ljubljana, 1944. I mean, a gate is kind of a bridge. It's an engineer's work, but it's also an architect's work. It's both. And why not bring, uh, you know, elements from the past also in engineering work? Otto Wagner used to do this too. And uh, I think it works. So you have the engineers work. You also have the architects work. They are together and they, you have, uh, you know, uh, 
industry and you also have uh, human needs together. Like look at these uh, columns here. You know, uh, who would do something like this today? No one, as far as I know. But I think we impoverished architecture a lot. The divorce between architecture and art is fatal. And I, I think uh, Gropius was right. It's fatal to both. Art dies if it doesn't contribute to, to the art of building, and the building also dies. We need, I think, the collaboration between the two. Now, let's see the third courtyard and obelisk, 1928. Look at this obelisk. It's quite modern in the vicinity of that old cathedral. He was also an esoteric architect. Uh, there is probably there is probably this aspect to his work, to some of his work, which is critical. The Eagle Fountain in, pra in the Prague Castle. Look at this fountain. It's just a fountain, but uh, you know, it's a unique fountain. And it's both modern and old. It's a small thing, but this small thing matters. What is this in Prague? So in 1931, I love this entrance into, I don't know, into some kind of a basement. But look at it, you know, the histories of architecture mentioned. It. And it's just, he didn't do the building, he did just this entrance. But look at it, it's eventful, it's, it's rich, it's uh, intriguing. Is anyone thinking today about bringing animals, you know, sculptures of animals into the, into the building? I don't think so. But maybe we should again. Now this project, which I mentioned, I regret it was not uh, built. It could have been indeed the talk of Europe, if not the whole world. This is the plan. So it was you know, supposed to be uh, the political uh, headquarters of Slovenia, the parliament building.
the section. He was without doubt a man of vision. And look at these uh, so-called classical columns, but uh, inclined, you know, I mean, you know, uh, not vertical. Uh, a gesture of non-conformism, uh, obvious for all to see. Even if it, it was not built, I think uh, it has its importance for the discourse on architecture and the history of architecture. So again, imagine this was built in Ljubljana. It would have been one of the most remarkable uh, buildings uh, built in Europe, not just in uh, Slovenia. So, you know, he conceived of, of it as being the cathedral of freedom. So a parliament, which would be the cathedral of freedom. Again, the conjunction between the sacred and the profane, at least as an aspiration. quite tall, you know, the conical dome, 120 meters. The Cathedral of Freedom. Are we building such cathedrals? I don't know. Certainly not in Bucharest. In Bucharest, we are building the Cathedral of Lack of Freedom, of dogma, of restriction and inhibition. And I would say even falseness. Here it is, uh, you know, made it into a, on, onto a coin in 2007. Catedrala Svoboda, Svobode. And we have a word in Romania, Slobod, which means free. I guess it comes from, it's connected uh, with this word, Svobode. Slobod, <laughs> Slobod. Now a cemetery in Ljubljana. I have some nice pictures here, not this one. From what I remember, some black and white pictures. Uh, are we thinking of death? Is the architect contributing to the Domus Eterna? I don't think so any longer, although there are exceptions. Uh, Florian Stanchu built a cemetery at the edge of Bucharest, which attracted my attention when I passed by with a bus. Look at these lamps, I mean, symbolically, you know, it's almost like a, like a faded uh, flower, you know. There is a, a mourning, the, the lamp is mourning the way it was designed. It is a regretful lamp because a life, a life ended. Something similar to an extent symbolically, although visually done differently can be found in the work of, uh, um, of the great Swedish architect Leverenz, uh, Sigurd Leverenz. He did something like this, uh, some lamps, you know, which with their heads lowered in the proximity of a church he built, expressing prob probably the same thing.
And this is the last image of this presentation on Joseph Plechnik, uh, Ljubljana designed by the architect jo Joseph Plechnik. We should have more cities in the world where an architect or several architects contributed so much as he contributed to Ljubljana. And now let's go to the, to the second presentation to Gottfried, uh, Gottfried Böhm. born in 1920, he almost made it to 100 years. I mean, uh, it's true, it's not, a, it's not a lie or an imagining that architects usually live long lives. Here is another example. He almost made it to the age of uh, Oscar Niemeyer. Gottfried Böhm. So let's read a little bit about him. So he was born just like Joseph Lechnik on, on the 23rd of January, but in 1920. So, uh, you know, younger than uh, Lechnik and died in 2021, that is last year. Was a German architect and sculptor and sculptor. Let's not uh, uh, be indifferent to this. His reputation is based on creating highly sculptural buildings made of concrete, steel, and glass. Berm's first independent building was the Cologne Chapel, Madonna in the, in the rubble, now integrated into Peter Zumthor's design of the Columba Museum renovation, a regrettable work, in my opinion, by Peter Zumthor. The chapel was completed in 1949, where a medieval church once stood before it was destroyed during World War II. Berm's most influential and recognized building is the Maria Königin des Friedens Pilgrimage Church in, uh, I don't know, I unfortunately, I do not know German. I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, you see the word, please pronounce it for yourselves uh, before I make a fool of myself. In 1986, Gottfried Böhm became the first German architect to be awarded the prestigious Pritzker Prize. Among the most recently completed construction projects involving Böhm are the Hans Otto Theater in Potsdam from 2006 and the Cologne Central Mosque completed in 2008. So now let's see some of his works. This was the man. Um, still uh, energetic uh, until his uh, whole life here, he is with uh, his brothers. <laughs> you know, a funny picture. He was probably the oldest here, but uh, still smiling. Yes, the Berm brothers. This is Gottfried, the Pritzker Prize laureate from, I think, 1986. Sculptor and architect. As a young man, I would say a handsome young man, and uh, he looks uh, determined to change the world as young people should have the, the ambition to do, even if they fail, but they should desire this in the name of the life moving forward. Drawings by Gottfried Perl. This building was built. I, I read about this church and you are going to see it, sculptural as it is indeed. These are typical renderings by Gottfried Perl. There is expressionism in his architecture. We don't talk these days too much about expression is, but I think expression is, is important because expression is important because emotion is important. That's why here he is drawing. Here he was drawing.
This is the plan of the church. And of course, the Orthodox churchman would not believe it. Now, this building uh, built in 1947, 1950 uh, for St. Columba in Cologne, in Köln, in Germany. The one that was, uh, you know, uh, how to call it, refurbished now, is the work of Peter Zumthor with fragments of because it was destroyed. It seems not too far away from the famous uh, Köln Cathedral. Now, um, I should have had here actually the intervention of, uh, of uh, Peter Zumthor, which in my opinion is problematic, despite some good parts inside the building. The city hall from 1962, 1969 in Bensberg. Um, sorry. Uh, I only understand here Rathaus and Symbios and Bauer, but the other, and historic, almost, almost all the works. I guess, you know, this is the old building and this is the building. It's a, it's a city hall uh, built by Gottfried Berg. As I read, he was also a sculptor, and uh, it shows in the building, well, exposed concrete. But uh, it has a, a certain uh, vivacity, although seen from this point of view is a little bit uh, not exceptional. There are other views that make it more interesting. But we do have the old and we do have the new. Of course, after Joseph Plechnik, uh, this, uh, this is an architecture which, despite its sculpturalness, uh, seems to be a little bit more simplistic than uh, you know, the whimsicalities and complexities of Joseph Plechnik. Maybe also because uh, Gottfried Böhm uh, doesn't uh, use uh, ornamentation too much if at all. But fortunately, he has this movement of the, you know, of the, of the building uh, in sculptural terms. The tower more than what's going on here. <coughs> Sorry. The, the church he built is very similar to, to, to the city hall, actually. A housing estate from 1965. Uh, I hope I have, uh, yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, color. And uh, I'm glad, you know, that, that he is able, he was able to rejuvenate himself, not just in terms of, uh, you know, sculpturalness, but also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, pictorial, uh, you know, e expressiveness. And, uh, you know, in the black and white picture is one thing, but in the, in the color picture is another thing. And color is important, of course. I think it's an interesting uh, housing complex. It has a certain medievalism as um, other buildings by him and also his drawings evoke. You know, you have staircases outside and there is varied, you know, and there is, he was clearly an artist as well. This is the plan. Well, with the exception of this part, you would say that this is rather, you know, predictable and so on, but uh, the views, the photographs show a certain complexity of the spaces uh, and, uh, you know, various size to, 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 to it. And again, the, the color matters. I think it matters.
what I also think matters is the, the fragmentation of the window into smaller parts, you know, connecting somehow with a certain tradition within which glass was uh, forced in all the times to, to, to do that. You know, today we just use a big piece of glass, you know, uh, even for very large openings. And I think something is lost, actually. You remember the Cathedral of Freedom by uh, Joseph Lechny? Well, I think any building should express, you know, more explicitly or implicitly to a larger degree or a smaller degree, an aspiration towards freedom. Because there are so many restrictions in life. Why should our buildings express the same thing? Why should we imprison ourselves continuously in so many ways? And I'm glad, you know, even, I don't know if this was his intervention to depict a plant here on the, on the concrete. Why not? Why not? I think it adds something to the building and maybe even this uh, attempt at a graffiti uh, with its, uh, you know, disorderly conduct uh, adds something actually, it adds life. Uh, it's fine. And you know, uh, this, uh, you know, these windows and these windows and these windows, they are all different, they're all different. And, you know, it's important to have variety. Just like on the, on the church by uh, Joseph Plechnik, the ivy climbs happily on the building, on some parts of the building, you see there are all kinds of buildings. It's a large complex. There are also, um, you know, uh, two floors uh, buildings. Gottfried Bern. You know, I, I talked, uh, when I talked about Joseph Lechnik about the columns having three parts. Well, you see, even got with uh, Berman, maybe this is, uh, you know, somewhere, if not underground, uh, but underneath of the building. So even here, the columns respect the same typology expressed, you know, in his own, uh, uh, you know, as he chose, but uh, still about uh, expressing the, this, uh, you know, the three parts of a column, which uh, not accidentally were done, uh, you know, conceptually, so to speak, uh, in the same way uh, since uh, the beginning of columns, so to speak.
Now, this, this church uh, uh, in Köln itself, I would say interesting, is less famous than the other church we are going to arrive at uh, soon, but uh, still look, again, the, the roof matters. Well, it matters in any building, but in the case of a church, even more so. And look at the windows. You know, they are quite uh, visceral through the metallic work. I wish I had more pictures, but um, that's all I have for now. Sorry. Iglesia, a church from 1968, a youth center library. Uh, connected with the church, or I think he designed also the church and the library. I'm not sure if he designed the church too. The idea to connect a library with a church, I think is an excellent one, because uh, in the Middle Ages, and perhaps not only in the Middle Ages, a church was a center of, of uh, literacy and culture and learning. So to have a library, uh, you know, connected with the church is a good thing. I don't know about transforming completely a church into a library as Dan Hanganu did in Canada. Uh, maybe that is to go a little bit too far. But one thing is for sure, to connect the act of learning with the act of praying or of faith is perhaps a good thing. There are two functions that uh, although it is said we were expelled from paradise because we wanted to know, so we, we took a bite from the, you know, the fruit of, uh, of knowledge. But uh, I, I do think that uh, knowing and, and uh, having faith shouldn't be, or worshiping shouldn't be, you know, uh, disjunctive. It must be helpful to be an artist and build because the artistic sensibility wants to manifest itself. And uh, in one way or another, this is shown in the building. And when you try to combine concrete, exposed concrete work with uh, exposed brickwork, I think uh, often uh, the result is good. Frank Lloyd Wright didn't like concrete. He thought it was uh, just a conglomerate. He loved bricks. But the uh, meeting between concrete and brick could create, uh, I think, uh, often uh, good, uh, good results. Now, this is the church that uh, I read about, and I, I hesitated to pronounce the name of the, of the town, uh, N-E-V-I-G-S. This is the church. And you saw the, the drawings, the, you know, the renderings or preliminary drawings or studies. It's indeed uh, his most cultural work and his most famous work. Expose concrete. So standing, standing like a concrete mountain amid a wood, the jacked concrete volume of this uh, cathedral of Saint Mary of Nevigs towers over its surroundings, built on a popular pilgrimage site in Western Germany, well, now Germany, the Marian Dome is only the latest iteration of a monastery that has drawn countless visitors and pilgrims from across the world for centuries. 
Unlike its medieval and Baroque predecessors, however, the unabashedly modernist Marian Dom reflects a significant shift in the outlook of its creators, a new way of thinking for both the people of post-war Germany and the wider Catholic Church. I think that in as much as in order to preserve culture, we must create it, I think, symmetrically in order to preserve faith, we must create it. So a new way of thinking should be promoted also within the church. Something difficult to understand by the theologians of this country and those who run the church. Pilgrims have been making their way to this place since the late 18th century when the church of the, of the time first played most host one Immaculata, a venerated copper engraving depicting the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. The site's popularity proved too great for the existing Baroque monastery, leading to the construction of an annex structure in the early 20th century. Even with this purpose-built structure, a spike in pilgrimage pilgrimages following the Second World War again saw the church of this place significantly over its modest capacity. In 1960, it was then decided that a new pilgrimage church would be built to cope with the influx of visitors. Just a second, I received a strange message from Zoom. Okay, so here it is, the church. With this goal in mind, the Archbishopric of, uh, Bishopric of Köln, Cologne, organized an architectural competition to take place between 1963 and 1964. The contest called for a church building with seats for 900 worshippers, with standing room for 3,000 more, quite big. Other required elements included two chapels, a confessional church, a sacristy, a bell tower, and other ancillary spaces. The winner, chosen by both the jury and particularly by Kearns, Archbishop Joseph Fringe, uh, who I think was, uh, I'm not sure, but I think he was a significant fighter against Nazis, who was almost blind at the time, was a German architect named Gottfried Berg. You see, maybe it's true, you know, Theresias in the Greek mythology, the, the one who saw the tragedy of the Trojan War, of the Trajan, Trajan, Trojan War, was also blind. So, the seer often is blind. And here we have an archbishop who was almost blind at that time and chose this architect, Gottfried Byrne. Here is the archbishop, bravo to him, an enlightened man. You see, I, what can I say? I'm emotional because, because the church is supposed to be an enlightened place, you know, not a place of dogma, but a place of learning with people of vision, with people of love, who love God and love life and love creativity. This man was like this, and he chose the correct architect probably. His episcopal motto was pro homini hominibus constitutus, which in Latin means appointed for the people. You see, appointed not by the people, but for the people, and, the, and appointed not by the church, but by the people and for the people. So, a churchman should serve the people, not themselves or itself. And this man did this, pro hominibus constitutus, bravo to them. And this is the building by Gottfried Byrne. So I don't know, I, the text uh, seems to uh, begin from somewhere else. Otherwise featureless gray expanses of concrete are punctuated with windows of brilliantly colored stained glass, primarily red, blue, and green. The windows designed by Berm himself, meaning the architect, depict in abstract a number of typical Marian themes because it's dedicated to Maria, uh, the mother of Jesus, including a large red rose. For the Marian capelle, uh, for the chapel, uh, Berm also created an elaborate 
composition centered around the ichthys, the symbolic fish which represents Christ, scattered throughout the church as sculptural works by other artists, including a marble column, an altar designed by Elmar Hillebrand, Gottfried Böhm's own son, Marcus, who was also responsible for the painting of the lower church. And here it is. What do we see here? We see a red flower. What is a red flower? It's love, it's passion, it's emotion, it's the heart. That's what it is. Despite being situated in a small, relatively remote community, the Marian Dome is monumental in scale. Böhm was a noted German expressionist who felt that sacred architecture, contemporary or otherwise, should elicit emotion in the viewer. Whether approaching by rail, road, or on foot, one can see a mountain-like peak of concrete from a far, from a far way off. The path up to the church is lined on one side by a wall and by the offices and convent on the other forming a sense of formal procession as pilgrims make the final leg of their journey. This makes me think a little bit, of course, this building is very, very different from Chartres Cathedral, but I remember going with a train from Paris towards Chartres and seeing from afar Chartres Cathedral and a very emotional visual encounter. Uh, here, the pilgrims also move toward this church uh, you know, uh, hoping to find the, what they search for. So once construction, uh, co constructed and consecrated in 1968, this uh, Marian Dome became uh, the second largest church in Germany, outdone only by the Gothic Cathedral in Köln itself. The concrete mass of the building, while giving the impression that it was impregnable, actually began to leak by the 1980s. At the time of construction, concrete's natural tendency to crack had evidently not been taken into account. Of course not, he was an artist. And as an artist, he probably had technical deficiencies. Concrete patchwork done during the 1980s elicited uh, criticism as the patches being of a, a different of a different shade than the original material were seen as ruining the buildings aesthetic purity under supervision, under the supervision of the architect son Peter Böhm. However, a second effort to patch the concrete is expected to resolve the issue while maintaining the original out, outward appearance of the church for both pilgrims and architectural enthusiasts alike. Look at the ceiling. It's not a ceiling that comforts you, you know, it's, it shows struggle. But the quest for God perhaps should not be removed from what we call struggle. Even Jesus struggled, no? So why shouldn't we? It's an austere church. But engaging and interesting and uh, provocative. A uh, mountain built by men of concrete. Uh, here is a, an existing uh, house which had nothing to do with Gottfried the Berm, but is welcome to be there as well. Now, another church, Kirche in Saarbrücke, very different from the previous one. No, very different. but itself creative and interesting. We had seen quite a number of churches today, both from uh, Joseph Plechnik and uh, Gottfried Berg.
There is another in the history of German architecture and European architecture and world architecture. There is another architect with the name Böhm, Dominicus Böhm, who also built churches. And it's possible that um, Gottfried Böhm is uh, actually connected. It might even be that he was uh, his, uh, his uh, grandfather, if not his father. Uh, please, I suggest if you want search for Dominicus Böhm, a very interesting uh, German architect himself who built uh, important churches, architecturally very significant. So you see, it was a family with preoccupations in this field. His sons also, you know, Peter and the other one, they uh, contributed to the previous building that we saw and, you know, one himself an architect. You know, a whole family, you know, uh, on the spiral of time worked uh, in the same field. Another Kirche. I don't know, was it built? It was. Uh, and again, the typical rendering uh, by, by uh, Gottfried Byrne. I don't think he allowed other people to draw for him. I think he made, him, he made the drawing himself. He was an artist, so you know how could he let other people do the drawing? And the building is, is what we saw in the drawing. I guess there was an existing church there and he just uh, added to it, just this part, of course. But, but, you know, Germany, as you know, was heavily bombed. So, you know, many buildings were destroyed or damaged. Gottfried Bern. The first German architect that received the Pritzker Prize. No other architect yet followed him in this field. The Stadtbibliothek, this is in Ulm? I think so. It's a, it's a library. It makes me think of the mountainous uh, bookstore or library by uh, MVRDV in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. Uh, this was built before them. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. I hear, I hear a noise in the background. We are approaching the end. Thank you. Now, here, in my opinion, he chose wrongly because glass is not good for library because uh, libraries, because natural light in contact with paper is not, uh, is not something that makes that paper very happy because it affects the paper. But who knows, maybe it's a special glass I would still stay away in the case of a library from so much glass. I mean, even Dominique Perrault in Paris, in La Bibliothèque de France, he has the, those prisms made of glass, and then he introduced afterwards um, oblongs to obturate the, to 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 make the, the you know the access of natural light into the library uh, difficult. Initially, from what I know, uh, no oblongs were imagined or projected, but, but they became needed. So please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Uh, there are even futuristic elements here, like this elevator here, shaft in, uh, inside the library. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Sorry about the resolution of this picture. We are really at the end of the presentation. So the, the only German architect who received the Pritzker by now, Gottfried Böhm, uh, had a, quite a number of commissions in various uh, for various functions churches uh, housing uh, library now 
um, a theater here from 1974-1980. It's probably some kind of a hybridity at place here. He, I, I imagine he, there were existing parts in all, all building, he introduced some new parts, but we see the same concern uh, that he had in the housing complex that we saw for uh, connecting the, the buildings and the interior of the buildings with the outside, you know, the outer space through these exterior uh, staircases. It's, I, I would say it's an interesting, uh, you know, again, uh, hybrid uh, uh, accumulation of various functions, housing and uh, who knows what else, an uh, entrance into a theater, uh, maybe a bar or something, uh, you know, uh, I think this makes always a good, uh, a good um, environment for, for living in. Again, if I compare this with the white uh, cubes uh, of today uh, in some parts, I, I prefer this. You know, uh, this is conducive to life, I think. It is not an inhibited building and it is not an inhibited building. It doesn't, it, it doesn't inhibit and it's not inhibited itself. Uh, sorry for repeating the word inhib inhibition uh, several times in you know, just one phrase. I see, I would say it's an interesting, uh, again, and it's this fragmentation that, uh, you know, although it's a modern building, it could uh, sit quite well in a medieval context. And it's possible that, you know, the building uh, uh, here, I mean, I don't know if it's really medieval, probably not, it's uh, newer, but still uh, much older than this one. And, uh, you know, they are good neighbors. And again, you, when you divide the, the glass parts, even it's, these are large, uh, you know, surfaces of glass, but he divides them into smaller parts and this matters, you know, it's, it's, it, it matters. It, it, the window has a character, has a, its own personality. And it is also uh, brought to, to the human scale in a way, just like the doors here and the windows here. So he was able to, to, to do architecture in, 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 in a variety of ways, um, you know, for, for different programs. What is this? Again, I have to learn German before it's too late. Meet Elizabeth Böhm and Peter Böhm, probably his son and his wife. Um, look, a more adventurous building uh, in 1991, 1998. So, he was already you know, more than eight years old. Uh, he, he died at 99, so uh, in 2021, last year. Okay, this is the building by the Berm family, by uh, Gottfried, Elizabeth, uh, and Peter. I don't know if Peter and Elizabeth also had or have uh, sculptural, uh, you know, interests, but the sculptor, uh, the, you know, uh, Gottfried Böhm uh, did his part, you know, by bringing sculpturalness into the building. And I think he did well, you know, why shouldn't we have some variety?
I'll compare this building with this one here. Which one is more alive? I would say this one. With all the risks it took, and you know, uh, uh, this one is more alive than the one here because it's freer. That's why. Now, the Hans Otto, we are really at the end of the presentation. This is, I think, his latest work, the Hans Otto. No, no, it is a, a mosque, and I don't even know if I have that work here shown. But we look at the Hans Otto Theater in Potsdam from 1995 to 2006. You saw there is the, the is um, you know uh, understood as being some kind of an expressionist architect. Yes, and the expressiveness and expression uh, should belong to architecture at least uh, moderately, at least to an extent. Here we have the expressionism of the canopies of the roofing. Maybe not very complicated. I mean, the shape is just the shape after all. I personally prefer uh, earlier buildings by him. But still, considering what theater is, you know, some kind of a temporary estrangement from life or quite the opposite, a temporary plunging deeper, more intensely into life through the art of theater. You could look at it both ways. I personally think that good art is not an estrangement from life, but uh, an intensification of life. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, the activities and hopefully of what happens here uh, are in that spirit, an intensification of life. And the reddish uh, roofing and, and the forms used maybe express that. Sorry about this salami thing. Uh, uh, they uh, they uh, they bother me with the uh, uh, you know incessant uh, display of so-called authorship. Another church, more static, but still uh, you know interesting through its medievalism. It's almost teutonic in a certain way. I think we saw today maybe more than 10 churches. Here is, uh, you know, I guess a book or uh, the drawing he did uh, for the theater in Potsdam that we just, uh, that we just saw. That's it. Uh, so let's wish happy birthday to both uh, Joseph Plechnik and uh, Gottfried Böhm on this uh, day of 23rd of January uh, 2022. Thank you.